first of all, you know, 2020 is going to be led by by drilling for the most part. That's going to be the number one catalyst. We right now are foreseeing about 18 months worth of drillable targets, and we've started permits for even more drill targets in the background at Sombrero that should continue after that time. So, you know, I think drilling is the main driver for us, and that's where the share price will react the most. Welcome back to Mining Stock Education. Thanks for tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. We are touching base with one of our sponsors today, that being Oren Resources and its executive chairman, Ivan Bebek. Company's website is orenresources.com and it trades under the ticker AUG both in Toronto and New York. That's unique because many companies have different tickers in on the different exchanges, but Oren has the same ticker, AUG. There's always a lot going on with Oren Resources. Uh, Ivan and the team there are always picking up uh, new projects, advancing their current projects. So Ivan, thanks for joining me again. And as I looked over your last few press releases, it seems like you're doing a lot at your Curibaya project in Southern Peru. Yeah, thank you very much. Great to be back. The, the Curibaya project actually we acquired four and a half years ago and we had one third of uh, two big land claims that make up an 11,000 hectare property on one of the most prolific belts in actually Peru. Uh, mines such as Serra Verde, Tocopala, Kia Veco, or Tia Maria's that just got permitted for construction. You know, this has really got some of the, the biggest mines in Peru, even bigger than Las Bambas on this belt. But again, another world class trend. What we liked about it originally was the address. You know, if you want to find a big mine, you have to go on these big trends. But when we finally were able to get the other two thirds owned by a Peruvian, as well as um, uh, I guess a major mining company had surrendered their third because they couldn't get all three to this Peruvian entity. The Peruvian entity actually was an Australian listed company that ran out of capital for its exploration and became a hearing aid company. So what we did did was we negotiated with the hearing aid company. They wanted a straight purchase. They weren't mining oriented and we came together for a quarter million dollar US purchase in August. What we saw that we liked on this portion of our position on the belt was we saw some historical high grades and we thought this is exciting. There's high grade silver, gold and copper on this belt of these major mines. And if you looked at our last two press releases, you now see over 55 samples of silver from 200 grams silver to 14 kilo silver with a lot of one to two, three kilo silver and in, in over a six square kilometer area. Um, that's truly spectacular from, from any perspective, walking onto a property and getting that as your first look. Um, to go with the silver, we're seeing one to 25 gram gold and 40 samples over the same area. And then there's these big structures coming into it from the west that are running from one to 14% copper. So what that means so far and, and what we do and what we don't know about it is this, is right address, the scale, six square kilometers of ridiculous grade of silver, gold, and these big copper structures coming through. We feel strongly that we're either right on top of one of these major porphyries or right beside it. Uh, a mine that would be similar to Kapaka, you, you see a big gold on top of the porphyry or beside the porphyry. You know, you could see a nice big precious metal deposit that sits on top or right beside a major porphyry. And so our swing here is quickly becoming competitive to the first targets we're going to drill at Sombrero. And um, I, I say that not to take away from Sombrero, but, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of sitting back with a massive surprise look on our faces saying, I can't believe this sampled so well. And it's kind of got the same theme that not only Sombrero, but Keegan or Kate and our previous companies had, each time we send somebody to the project, they come back with a new positive development. And that's kind of how Sombrero started was we went to see it six times in a row and it got better each of those six times. And now it just keeps getting better on a bigger scale, right? In terms of Kuribaya, we've been to it twice. There's a whole team that just went to it this week. And the guys are already buzzing on how they're they're really putting the pieces together. So, you know, I think from an investor standpoint, it's a spectacular opportunity that's not just base metals, but has a really nice precious metal start with the best silver grades I've seen in my career to date. And uh, yeah, we're just getting started on it. You have excellent accessibility and infrastructure at your Sombrero project. Um, you're going through permitting there. But before you give us an update on that, how does the Curibaya project compare when it comes to permitting, accessibility and infrastructure? Great question. Permitting, much easier. Huge check mark there. We can apply for a different type of permit approved that takes about six months from start to finish. Um, so less arduous process. That is a consequence of a lesser populated area that's uh, down by the coast. So it's, uh, it's an easier place to work. You're at reasonable elevation. Topography is working well for us. It's not 
I don't think any project is as situated as well as Sombrero with power lines that were built on top of the property since we owned it. But it is very accessible that way. Power is not far. It's not as good as Sombrero, but it's still good. I think the big part there is you, you've got to look towards the accessibility is, is really good and the actual permitting is going to be a lot quicker and easier because of where it is. But there's no concerns from an infrastructure standpoint at this time. And there's a lot of options how you bring power in and there's definitely access to water. So another really good place in Peru to be a little bit better because less people are present makes the permitting easier. But yeah, no, a really, really good place from that perspective. So with your Sombrero project, which was already huge, huge about a month ago, you announced the additional staking of some more land there. Can you tell us about this? Yeah, this is interesting. Um, we're waiting for these permits impatiently. I'd say that, uh, you know, <laughs> facetiously but um, we're patiently waiting for these permits and the guys had a few holes in the 7,000 square kilometers that we screened trying to put together this really optimal land position as first movers on extending that huge belt um, what happened was we went back to one of these holes at a very low cost and we started screening ground and doing more of our bleg sampling which is going down into the valleys and sampling basically the the clays or the the icing sugar kind of grained sand to get a very representative you know um, idea of copper and gold in the regions we found our highest grade copper in the entire 7,000 square kilometers we sampled even much higher than what you see at sombrero north where we're about to start drilling that the whole world's excited about and this is a, a 72 square kilometer footprint so it's big. It's really big. And, um, you know, it, it got the phone ringing from a lot of people on the technical side that follow our progress here. Uh, for us, the second major thing about it, it's within the same community we already have agreements with. So I think you can expect to see us uh, real shortly, if not in the next few weeks, uh, early next year, we'll be uh, we'll be sampling it and getting it ready to uh, put it into the drill permitting process system early next year. But truly spectacular. I mean, it's the highest grade we've sampled by the methodology that puts Sombrero together year to date, and it's over 72 square kilometers, which is truly it's it's a size that we look for, you know, as an exploration team. You've mentioned in past interviews with me that you have confidentiality agreements signed with some majors because of your Sombrero project and its prospectivity. But uh, with all this additional staking and the results you're bringing forth to the market, are, is there kind of a staking rush going on around you here? Uh, that's a good question. Not everybody signed confidentiality agreements. And the reason why people do it is so that they can have a look at your raw data because we show the high level to the market. And um, you know it's proprietary information and it puts the company at risk if you don't have some type of an ar arrangement if you're gonna show your data. Um, a lot of the parties that didn't sign CAs, you know, and I'm not gonna isolate any individual and I'll actually mention all of them because they're on our map, but um, you see Freeport McMoran staking right next to it. You see uh, Rio Tinto, you see Sumitomo, you know, these are three major, major mining companies that didn't sign CAs and they've all got claims adjacent to us now on this belt. So no question is there a bit of a staking rush, but there's not a lot left for them to stake of consequence because I have to compliment our technical team. They were very thorough and we were very aggressive in putting together, you know, the commanding land position for the belt. So I like to think we got most of it at the very least and uh, it's nice to see them staking adjacent to us and some of our claims not just here but also by sombrero north ivan in our last interview you had talked about potentially putting the drills there at sombrero in february are we still on track for that yeah you know it's it's not a, a science or a fixed date that you can rely on but we're still on track for february q1 to have permits to go drill so that's very much in line that hasn't changed yet and uh, we look forward to that if that changes um, we'll certainly will update you and the rest of our shareholders but as of right now that stays as the uh, as the time we plan to have our drill permits you also had news from uh, Committee Bay in northern Canada. Can you give us the highlights of uh, what you announced here in October? Sure. It was a, a small, the smallest program we did in five years. We've now spent about $60 million trying to figure out on how to find gold underneath cover in one of the more tougher regions in the world to go explore. The good news is the rewards are huge here. The breakthrough we had this year would fall into the technical success category. We found a signal in our geophysics. That's basically the currents that we put into the ground to see what's underneath the ground. And it was very, very 
specific to the high grade at uh, three bluffs are deposit of 1.2 million ounces of nearly eight grams per ton. So what the guys have done is they took all the tens of meters that we've drilled. We've drilled 30, 40 meter widths, which would be mining widths in this part of the world of lower grade. And they compared the signals on a statistical basis to the high grade. Needless to say, we now have the signal for high grade. It's the key. I think that's going to be a massive driver for us on making not just drilling mineable widths of gold, which we've done extensively, but to actually go find the high grade portion of these things. Um, you know, that that is something that has come out as a revolutionary discovery for us technically. And we are now looking at all the data we have along the belt and we're compiling targets. And hopefully at uh, some point in Q1, and we're going to have a press release which will show people how many of our targets are currently ready for um, for drilling from that data and then how many more we're going to want to go back and do some more work. But the goal at Committee Bay is really to do what we did a few years ago before Gold Corp invested $36 million. And that's going to be to go up and down the belt and put together 10 or 15 targets that have that high grade signal to go with all the other gold elements we found. But truly, it's a bull market project. We've always said that. We've never shied from it because it is is in the Arctic, but it still is one of the premier places on the planet to go find multiple 5 million ounce high grade discoveries as they're being found in the Arctic and mines are being built, such as Amaruk by Nico Eagle. So it's something you'll see more from in Q1 and it's really exciting for us because we think we finally cracked the way to target high grade up there. So could you provide an overview of what speculators should look forward to in 2020 and how are you going to finance this? Sure. Uh, gr great questions. Uh, first of all, you know, 2020 is going to be led by, by drilling for the most part. That's going to be the number one catalyst. We anticipate, as I mentioned, the drilling for Sombrero North, the specifically Sombrero main targets in the first quarter. And we believe those will be followed by permits to drill NEOC, our second target, midway through the year. And then the third or the last quarter of the year, we're going to have access to drill Curry Baya. So we right now are foreseeing about 18 months worth of drillable targets. And we've started permits for even more drill targets in the background at Sombrero that should continue after that time. So, you know, I think drilling is the main driver for us. And that's where the share price will react the most. Um, secondly, on the Canadian side, you're just going to see both home stake and you're going to see Committee Bay come together with, you know, number one, Homestake, where we have information to put out there. We've worked on it this summer. We're looking to expand targeting on it, as well as to uh, talk a bit more about the value of that project. But on Committee Bay, you're going to start to see the platform for major potential gold discoveries on the back of five years of trying to figure out the science there. So, you know, it's going to be a busy year, predominantly led by Peru. Um, we get to drill everything we love in Peru continuously. Then the Canadian side, uh, you know, it's going to be a bit quieter just because we're going to be focused in Peru and watching our treasury. You asked me how we're going to finance it. Um, great question. We financed ourselves this year. Uh, we've done three financings. Two were uh, with insiders and close friends and family. We've stayed away from doing a market financing because we're looking for a very special type of investor, somebody substantial on the strategic side, that would uh, you know, be, be more of a deeper pockets, well-known representative that would upgrade the shareholder registry. And that person is somebody we're, we're patient to wait for while we finance ourselves. Um, if not, potentially a, a corporate at some point, we may entertain another one like we have in the past at a premium to our share price, should there be interest in the terms be favorable. But you know, we're, we're very anti-dilutive as you're aware, and we're looking to make sure we're upgrading our registry. Um, we've been offered money quite a bit this year, and you can tell by our share price performance it's not really that impactful but we're going to look to do something that's extremely intelligent in terms of upgrading the shareholder registry and you'll probably see something between now and february but we don't have any immediate plans to rush anything because uh we're funded right now through those that time period i've been in the junior mining sector news this week it's been the idea or the re-implementation on the toronto venture exchange of the uptick rule where you can't short uh, a sub $250 million micro cap or uh, company unless that company is trending upwards. Um, I talked to Rick Rule in a recent interview, and he is not for the reinstatement of that. He said, let, let free markets be free markets. His friend, Eric Sprott, however, is for the reinstatement of that rule. Uh, what's your take here? That's very interesting because they both work with Sprott. Yes. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> imagine what the dinner like conversation is like there with them. Um, you know, as a consequence of heavy shorting that we've experienced throughout the year, um, you know, we've had several investors complain and we have complained to the Toronto Stock Exchange, to the New York Stock Exchange, because at the last, you know, 30 seconds or 50 seconds of the day, you see this downtick that's 
uncharacteristic to the daily volume and it's kind of like a manipulation downwards right it does not give fair trading representation to the company um you know if, if we weren't victim of that kind of treatment and if you were to ask me the bigger question was where do you think you guys should be trading today on an opportunity like sombrero forget everything else that you have in your technical team you know we're describing sombrero as an analog to las bombas the 10th largest copper mine in the world you know where should speculators be on your share price i'd say we're grossly undervalued full stop and this would be based on third-party validations both from analysts as well as major mining companies and trusting a, an extremely intelligent technical team that's formerly global experts from newmont so i find that our busyness in our trading and watching our share price we're, we're putting a lot more money and energy towards making sure our stocks are fair, fair valued um we have a public float that's not between you know really good investors that are our long-term investors of about 15 million shares we've traded 70 million shares between canada and our u.s exchange from january 1st I, i'm quite sure we haven't turned over our investors you know four or five times this year as it would represent by the volume so it's you know it's it's unfair to the average speculator because it takes a lot away from the opportunity that's in front um we don't have an ambition to be 50 cents higher we don't mind if we're 50 cents lower what we care about is delivering this tier one discovery to the market however you know i think some investors get deterred at times when they say hey if it's ivan if it's so good and you have all this confidence in it you have all this third party validation you know why is the stock not performing better on on good days we go down and bad days we go up you know what i can't explain is in the last, last few weeks since we announced committee bay i saw about a five million share buy order in our market and i have no idea who that was and where it came from was it short covering possibly is it some kind of a corporate strategic taking a toehold in the company possibly i don't know but because there's so much of this shorting in this you know there's no uptick rule it's really tough for us as a company to explain it so we just try to focus more on the general business of the company and this is why we've been so militant about finding the right investors and doing a financing that would not be the typical one that would expose us to where shorts could cover through financings and stuff like that so you know i think it's a big problem problem I would I would side with Eric Sprott for good reason I think that companies in this state you know insiders are buying stock as I bought lots of shares of Orin you know to represent my confidence alongside shareholders I think that it's unfair for companies like this in turbulent markets because all markets being equal and to Rick's point you know I don't disagree with that that a fair trade market environment is is completely legitimate However, I don't agree with the manipulated in market environment either. And we're looking at an industry which is having a hard time finding capital and raising capital. And we're looking at an industry that's having also a hard time finding major deposits as they're a lot harder to find globally. So if we cripple the stocks that are trying to go out and raise money and find these discoveries that are going to be essential towards the uh, the future copper demand on the electrification of the planet you know and clean energy clean burning or you know other metals that are used on a, even on an industrial basis you know it's going to really put the planet in a unique place it'll probably make commodity prices go through the roof but um no it's an industry that's tough enough as it is without that you know we're coming out of that bear market now and that's a really exciting thing and i think eventually this all goes away but for the time I'm being it's it's been tough for the last couple of years for a lot of people and not so much ourselves but a lot of other companies your price uh, on the US exchange right now is about a dollar 30 per share for Orin and then you have in your presentation on page 31 several analysts that are doing forecasts US two dollars US 220 US 325 and just as an investor myself I've always struggled with uh, on stocks like yours and companies that are built like yours where the speculators will be rewarded for expiration how do these analysts even come up with these price targets because if you're successful as you've articulated to me and my audience your price is going to be a lot higher than three dollars and 25 cents us you know what um i think this until the first drill holes come out and we call that the truth machine and it shows the world what's here i think there's going to be a lot of different opinions at the dinner table right some people are going to say hey look your your analysts are global experts from newmont they're legitimate um, you have you've done this twice before and you've rewarded investors incredibly well um, you know we, we respect the fact that major other major mining companies recognize the opportunity 
um, and analysts are describing it as is if you look at Beacon's most recent report, he was just on a site visit last week. Uh, Michael Curran, he is a re- really well respected analyst and he qualified Sombrero as the right rocks, the right place and the right scale. And, you know, everything that we're advertising is being validated. So, you know, I think that when you start to drill this kind of a project, I think that these analysts, things will change a lot. And I think that you'll see targets that are more representative. The other thing I will caution a lot of your viewers and everyone is some analysts are not geologists. And if you want to speculate properly, look to the analyst who's a geologist and uh, and see what he has to say. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of people that are not geologists. They're, they're well educated. They know the marketplace well. But how, how are they going to understand you know, the geophysics, the geochemistry, the, the cool sciences that we use to go find these deposits. So, you know, I'm not I'm not saying I want higher buy targets today. I'm saying that they will probably a lot closer together once things start happening. But look to the analysts that have some sort of technical background and, and the ones that have been to the project with that background, because uh, they truly are going to be the ones that that understand it better. Um, you know, it's, I've seen analysts, I mean, we have a $5 Canadian buy target out of Canada Corp, you know, and I mean, who is right? Is it him or is it a $2 US target? I think these targets are all based off of our Canadian assets. I think very few of them have factored much in terms of value for Sombrero and what it might be. If you were to go and say, what's a fair price? Like, where do you think this could go if Sombrero's right? All I can do is say, if we found another Lost Bombas, which is what our what we think we're going to do here in the northern part of our Sombrero claims, that company sold for eight billion dollars. Uh, Glencore sold that asset to MMG in 2014. Um, Two billion, I believe, was infrastructure. About six billion was the value of the uh, that was given for the metal content, which is about fifty billion dollar ore body today, gross value. If you take half of that and you take two and a half or three billion dollars of the six billion that was given for that part of it and we're copper gold not copper molly you know you're looking at current dilution assumed share price you're looking at around 25 30 dollars a share is what we'd be hoping to deliver to shareholders by analogy to something that's right next door same rocks same age of rocks which is critical and when you're looking to to say you have the same system and same scale of, of mineralized rocks that we've mapped and, and sampled so far so you know i think there's a lot of room here to create a 10 to 20 time your money investment and, and that's something we've been chasing for our investors from day one it is a long road to big returns and there's a lot of risk along the way if some barrel works and i say if and i should say when but I'm going to be just, you know, very cautious here just because I'm just the optimistic and I don't want to I don't want to pin, pin myself in a corner. But if and when it works and we start to get sombrero right, I mean, the challenge isn't for us isn't going to be share price performance. It's going to be holding on to the asset long enough because I think it's going to be in the wheelhouse of all the major base metal companies in the world. And I think it's going to be quite competitive. I have not seen somebody go and extend an entire belt and stake the entire belt in the last two decades and you know sky's the limit of how many of these things can be found right now we see three years of exploration just in the north to kind of get through the first kind of tar- targets then we come down to Macha Makai and we look at the other claims we have in the belt I mean this is truly probably 10 to 20 years of, of exploration discovery potential across the belt and what why it's so preserved is because there's a lot of volcanic cover so you can't see the rocks, but there's ways to apply science to test it. You know, at Sombrero itself, we're seeing stuff undercover through geophysics that we haven't even, we're we're analyzing right now, we haven't announced yet, but, you know, we're just seeing more and more big evidences of big clusters of potential other intrusions. So size is is the appeal, getting an entire belt as a junior company or as any company, whether you're a major or junior, is truly a once in a lifetime opportunity. And that, that I think is being missed largely by the marketplace. Yes, we need money, but we're going to take it from a very good place. We're going to do it on our terms, not not anyone else's. And we're going to be very careful how we do that. In a day where many exploration companies struggle just to raise the TSX listing fees, you can see Oren is the exact opposite. They're staking new ground. They're preparing permits. The technical team is reviewing data. Uh, they're going to be drilling all of next year. Uh, this is a management team that you truly want to follow. Website again is orinresources.com. Ticker is AUG. Ivan, I look forward to touching base with you in January and getting an update on our progress. Thank you very much. Me as well. Thank you so much. 
Thank you for listening to this Mining Stock Education podcast. Please subscribe and share with like-minded investors. Visit us on the web at miningstockeducation.com for more resources on precious metals and natural resource investing. At our website, you can also sign up for our free newsletter for interview transcripts, stock picks, and more. 